A very good day. We begin our session on the budget federalism. Well, it's like a minefield. It's an explosive topic fraught with very many issues and problems, but also having some opportunities. So today I would like to outline some important points and things and pillars without aspiring to substitute for the distinguished speakers because they may have their own perspective on the fiscal federalism. So, number one, we are a country with a hugely uneven tax base and there may be no silver bullets or easy solutions. We will not uh, merge our constituent entities in, to have only 13 of them. And number two, we have the centrally planned redistribution model fiscal model because the federal center absorbs all the revenues and then redistributes them back, relegating them back to the lower level, the regional level. And before we uh, elaborate on that, I must say that we cannot give more revenues to the regions, dole it out to regions because the rental taxes, the uh, MAT and the VAT should be gathered on the federal level. But in this uh, case and under these circumstances probably will rid the regions of some of the liabilities and obligations like the insurance contributions. And if we redistribute the revenues, how and why we do that? And the, and the leveling dotation and subsidy now uh, equals one one quarter proportionately uh, it used to be more and uh, another question is why there is a great deal of other opaque uh, budget transfers and, and why we're seeing a rise in the share and proportion of subsidies that the federal ministries authorize and if we have the leveling, on the other hand, why the level of budget revenues received per capita in many regions is very low and it has been leveled off like a fence for the donor regions and for the recipient regions and it, it is a disincentive for the weak uh, in fiscal terms regions and economic terms. So now amid the pandemic I have started seeing the advantages of the central planning because uh, all of a sudden transfers to regions increased 1.5 times and funds were disbursed in order to help the regions cope with this contingency, with this externality. But is it going always to be like this, or shall we relax a bit when the pandemic is over? And when the, the pandemic uh, is over, what, what shall come out of that? And uh, you know, I, I studied the shortfall of revenues that the regions are post and the transfers that they were received. But you know, some of the regions had no shortfall of revenues, but still they received 30, 40, 50 billion worth transfers and others under received or didn't receive enough having having huge drop uh, or slump in revenues so this has been for the warm-up and uh, let me first give uh, the floor after the start uh, let me give the floor to mr. Kudrin I will not introduce him because we all know who these people are. Thank you, Natalia. In your works, in your papers, you have been speaking a lot about the problems of the constituent entities in, in fiscal and other terms. Uh, and you always poise very, very uh, s sharp and sore issues. And if I if I speak about the economic growth issues and the and the fine tuning of the balance between 
the distribution and redistribution of revenues between the central government, federal government, and the regional uh, level. I would I would call this one of the five to fi six key issues that we're faced with. But it's not only about the redistribution. The point is that a the regional level is the field for all economic change. They should have also the competence, the powers to act. They may have a free, they must have a free hand to act. And uh, well, we should grope for the happy medium, I, I, I believe. But you know, we should relax. The, this regulation and the regions should be given more funds and resources to to act because on the ground you can better see where the problem is like in in east west north or south they may have a different set of problems they may have infrastructure shortage or not and you know each region's ha region has its own inherent source and plagues, and this is why we should take their specifics into account. So the, the talk about how much or revenue remains in, in, in the federal center and how much is relegated to the uh, regional level is still uh, quite relevant. Like now we have the 55 to 45 with the tilt towards the federal center. And ours is a country with a patchwork of different uh, constituent entities, income-wise and revenue-wise. Nine regions account for 59% of all the fiscal revenues. 16 regions account for 72% of all the fiscal revenues. So that means in, that in the remaining 69 regions, there's only 38% of fiscal revenues. So definitely they have a very big difference in terms of revenue base. Uh, so the federal center has to indulge in redistribution. And myself being a finance minister in the past, in, my, in that capacity of mine, I, I did a lot to take into account different factors like the seasonality and the heating season length and the and the length of all the roads in a region. So in this case, these factors, these things must be factored in while calculating the redistribution equations. And uh, today, with respect to the support from the uh, federal budget last year, it was at its record highs, four point, around 4.3 trillion rubles of transfers around 4.5 trillion rubles, uh, which is an all-time record. And it was related to the national projects that had been initiated two years prior to that. And it was partly because of the pandemic. And uh, those were well targeted, specifically tinged subsidies. And the, sub and the constituent entities also had to contribute on a proportionate basis, on a pro-rate basis. And this uh, region's financial support pool was 50% 15, 50 in uh, 2018. And when I was minister back in the past, it, it was at 70%. And now this amount dropped till 27%. So these are all the subsidies, you mean all the subsidies, and less is spent for leveling, Le leveling accounts for less. Well, this, yes, probably is about the overall, the total subsidies, and their proportion went down, and they targeted once 
that are quite prescriptive and the governor cannot have any discretion in dealing with them have much greater responsibility going with them and the uh, Chamber of Accounts can see uh, a stringent set of rules in this respect and I believe that we should come back to the proportion of uh, leveling of uncommitted funds going back up to around 35 to 50 percent. And now we have a great deal of subsidies. We arrived at uh, very many subsidies that increased twofold over the past years, 2.5 years, starting from 2018 till 2021, from 126 to 313 types of subsidies. And on each of these specific subsidies, there'll be a separate agreement with each of the regions, with individual specific KPIs and targets for, for each of the constituent entities, which is a great deal of red tape. And uh, definitely we should merge all that and uh, come up with a, a set of overarching common goals and targets for the regions. The Federal Center believes, however, that the responsibility will be diluted and eroded, but we can judge as a rule of thumb that such subsidies not related to the construction of specific facilities or installations. Well, like a, a federal trunk road may last 50 kilometers, a, a segment may, may, may stretch 50 kilometers, but there are no exits because no funding was allocated. Or, for example, there must be one subsidy for hospitals and another subsidy to build roads and there is no alignment between them so currently we are seeing some tentative improvements in terms of aligning those subsidies so we should well we should increase the share of non-committed subsidies and second we should uh, have better alignment uh, between subsidies but anyway at, at the end of the day there's always the the re revenue base which is very diverse between regions and uh, so in this case the richest may come up with much more revenue and income that they may keep to themselves which is not our design and intention but so probably our main design here would be probably to give some powers to the federal additional powers to the federal level at the same time leaving some of the funds at the regional levels and and this is probably the the insurance contributions for non-workers and 783 billion was paid along this uh, line last year so for adolescents and children the mandatory as per the mandatory medical service 305 uh, billion was by, paid and uh, 207 was, billion was paid for the pensioners two-thirds of, of all the coverage was uh, was taken or ta taken care of by the regions and so probably we should pass those powers to the federal levels because they the federal uh, level is in charge of paying the pensions and uh, an individual receives a pension as by uh, the federal law so the federation should be in charge and those 267 billion should be evenly distributed between the constituent entities 
and we would avoid any any distinction between constituent, constituent entities. Hence, and with respect to children, this is also a, a possibility. So these two to three steps are the ones that we may take to, to rewire our, our, our fiscal and budget ties and uh, so that the constitutional powers of the constituent entities can be better fulfilled. And now let us turn to those who know how things stand on the ground. We, who are the regional governors? Mr. Minahanov, how can you name, can you name the source of the Russian fiscal federalism and what the opportunities may be? What is your perspective and what are your aspirations? Well, this issue is most relevant, but of course it is impossible to achieve a common understanding across all fields because the interests differ. I used to work at the municipal level and I always thought back then that people sitting in Kazan didn't understand the full picture, but when uh, Shemelov uh, appointed me as finance minister, it turned out that there was a team of professionals who knew what they were doing. And even though I never worked at the federal level, and today I have some serious grievances, I do not always share them out loud with my colleagues from the federal level, but still, as a head of a Russian region, I understand that there are some problems that need to be addressed, but I think I've been lucky. I work in a region that is self-sufficient, that can boast a big diversified economy, but uh, I remember our distinguished Mr. Kudrin used to be finance minister and almost, you know, everything trickles to the federal budget from our region. They are taking things little by little. Yes, I understand that the federal budget has many objectives to pursue, like law enforcement, defense, and many others. So we need to find common ground. And I have to tell you, just as you have pointed out, the pandemic has brought about serious budgetary issues regionally and at the federal level as well. The president and the government had to take drastic, swift steps. And it would be very hard for me to criticize the federal government at this point in time. They had to do what they had. But we still, thank God, get revenue from gas, from oil. We are one of the oil producing Russian regions, so we still get that money. Let me cite some statistics as well. Let's take 2010 and let's take 2021. The uh, gross regional product of Kazakhstan over this time span has increased 2.3 times. So it used to be 1 trillion, right now it's 3.3 uh, trillion as of last year. Whereas the revenue has only gone up 2.5 times, regrettably. Our colleagues who are responsible for the federal part of the budget are taking some steps and we see some redistribution of money. Yes, we do understand that some regions need additional support and why not working in a financially strong region, I would probably see differently. Let's take Tatarstan. We have a very big industrial output, 3,770 trillion. Our gross regional product is superior to 3.3 trillion. 
налоговых платежей. And of course, it's one trillion three hundred and fifty billion in tax payments. We have a revenue of our own around three hundred and thirty, and also we get some uh, federal money too, four hundred and fifteen. Yes, that's correct. But we are not, you know, just passengers. Nor are we free riders. We make a contribution of our own to the federal budget, and not just through our oil revenues. The thing is, we not only have to develop big projects of our own, we have a new oil refinery, we've got to overhaul the petrochemical facilities and CAMAS facilities have to be modernized as well. These are big projects. And uh, Mr. Kudrin will confirm that. We wrote together a strategy until 2030. And this strategy seeks to create a very good environment for small and medium enterprises, uh, several hundred thousand jobs last year, 320 billion in revenue and tax payments and 28 billion through SMEs. And this is still a very good contribution. It's new jobs too. We have industrial parks. And of course, the Chamber of Auditors has to assess how efficiently we spend the money from the federal level. We, I think, uh, can say that right now it applies to 10 regions in Russia only. They can get this kind of support, and I think Chelyabinsk will agree with that. But be that as it may, uh, I would like to remember Decree 119. So we spend together on infrastructure. It increases the throughput capacity and TATNEFT, our oil company, is going to launch six plants, 50, uh, 65 or 56 billion. That's the investment. And if we had no guarantees from the federal budget, it wouldn't have happened. Or oh, let's take the Labuga special zone, which is currently the best we have. But this uh, order, order 1119, allows us to expand, to work on precursors to hydrocarbons, um, and there is this ORS project as well. So infrastructure is being built, and residents flock in, but there is no additional place. There is. Well, I heard there were complaints that they were prevented from expanding these zones. Well, I have to tell you that we have no restrictions or limitations on our side, and we've got to use uh, some additional instruments like the responsibilities of the region, and we use this instrument to create, to set up additional enterprises. Well, it's understandable. Last year, we lost around 30 billion because highly viscous oil was, you know, it was uh, reduced in status to uh, other types of oil, even though it's costlier to get. And the oil company that was responsible for that simply lost its investment component. Yes, we do understand that the federal budget has to seek for additional revenue. And the decisions are adopted by our distinguished members of parliament. So income tax, let's have a look at that. It's around 10 billion or so, and we're not against sharing that. But it needs to be a decision. And also, the federal budget has to step in. Well, Mr. Minihanov, it's very good to be generous, but at someone else's expense. 
Well, probably not everyone knows that. Maybe if they knew, they would have done it differently, but our voice has not been heard. But things stand like that. What do I need? What I need is certainty, permanence. They need to tell us that they're not going to change the rules of the game for the next five, seven years. But when they see that there are big revenues in this or that field, they take all of this away. And our investment simply disappears in a puff. But on the whole, of course, we are grateful to the Ministry of Finance. Yes, we do have arguments, but we listen to one another. We talk to the federal government. Over the recent years, uh, with, the, uh, with, the, with, the, with the national projects, with the infrastructure uh, subsidies, we, we need to be very swift. Well, you got an advantage as a region that knows how to use the money you get efficiently. Others had to give the subsidies back partially. But yes, you, you said alcohol, for instance, production, it was centralized. But of course, everything that's on the surface, uh, it's in the spotlight. Well, you know, what I'm saying is that you have a different perspective from every place you work. Mr. Kudrin used to work at the region, and he had a different perspective. And then he moved on to the finance minister position and then to the Chamber of Auditors. Well, probably it's the, West, the best place for a compromise. Well, you know, it's dependent on where you work. I do not want to cast aspersions on anyone. I am simply speaking and sharing my point of view. Maybe if I were in Mr. Kudrin's shoes, I would have been even harsher. Alex Haley, unfortunately, I wanted to uh, sit uh, between you, but uh, the organizers uh, barred me from doing that. So I would like to turn to your neighbor sitting on the couch next to you. Uh, Alexei, tell us something about Chelyabinsk. Well, I'm not going to speak on behalf of Chelyabinsk region, but also on behalf of the state council. You know, I've studied the history of uh, budget transfers of inter-budgetary relations, and I think this issue has always been relevant, and Mr. Kudrin still has his work cut out, of, cut out for him, and it's too early to retire. If we look from the regional point of view about the issues that exist, and some of them have already been voiced today, then we will see that the balance of revenues between the federal center and the regions has been changing to the advantage of the federal center over the last 15 to 20 years. Ten years ago, more than 50 percent of revenues stayed in the regions, whereas right now this ratio is inverse. It's 54 for the federal center and the rest for the regions. This issue is there, and it generates the other issues we've spoken about today. Another problem is the differentiation between the most well-off regions and the least well-off regions. This is one of the key issues. And this is why we need new additional solutions. Well, in particular, the idea was floated today to pass the payment of the <coughs> obligatory medical insurance payments to the federal level, I support that. That would be a good idea. Another thing, federal solutions create additional expenditure for regions, which is not good. This has to be compensated. And even the budget code stipulates that. But unfortunately, this provision is not always respected. And of course, this means that regions have less money to spend on investment. We have carried out an in-depth analysis six, five years ago. Investment accounted for 15 to 20 percent in certain regions, but that was five years ago. Right now, it's 10, 11 percent. 
in several regions that are not self-sufficient. And these regions only spend 2 to 3 percent on investment. And uh, Mr. Husnulid said that that means that regions are becoming dilapidated. They have no money to renovate. These are systemic issues. And there are also some chronic, chronic issues that have to be addressed. The issue is still outstanding to ensure the sufficiency of resources for regions to perform all their powers, all their functions, regional functions as well as municipal functions such as orphaned children and other categories that regions have to care for. So this is our view of the issues that exist. And of course, we have discussed these issues at the State Council Commission. We made the calculations and we came up with several proposals. We floated these proposals. The first proposal we put forth is to transfer the payment for medical insurance to the federal level for children, for minors, for adolescents, for pensioners, which correlates with the current strategy. There is also the payment for able-bodied population who are not working. The money needs to stay in the regions for them to be able to address these issues. And Mr. Kudrin has spoken about that. This is a big chunk of money that can be funneled into additional investment opportunities for the regions. Moreover, we believe that we could earmark some of the money for investment purposes. The current digital treasury tool allows us to do that. We could do that to 50 to 30 percent of additional resources. That's very important. You know, just not to spend all of the money that we free up for routine purposes, we need to create some investment potential for each and every region. Of course, the finance ministry is against. It is willing to allow some kind of a trade-off, but this revenue needs to be some additional revenue for the regions to address the bottlenecks. Unfortunately, targeted subsidies cannot solve the issue. They need additional money. Another important thing, we, we mentioned that as well throughout our today's discussion. We, if we look in general, then we will see that the assistance to regions has become an increasingly targeted. If we look at the national projects, we see that additional money is flowing in. But over the last three years, the redistribution donation hasn't budged a little. One percent, you know, it's the money taken from the regions and the rest comes from the federal center, but it hasn't been indexed and it has to be readjusted on a yearly basis. Let's look on 2021st. And indeed, thanks to this 1%, the readjustment has taken place, whereas the federal part has not been readjusted. And it's not going to be readjusted for the coming three years. And we believe this is one of the tasks we need to address in order to improve the current state of affairs. I have to point out that as far as the federal budget is concerned, it listens to us and it understands our problems. We agreed for this year that if a region crosses the threshold of budgetary Self-sufficiency, it's not going to lose the subsidies right away. It's going to take some time to win them off the subsidies, to taper it off. And it'll motivate regions to bolster up their own resource base, their own financial base. There are other important problems that exist. Very often, some revenue is lost due to drastic decisions adopted by the federal budget. Luckily, this year, the budget, the federal budget listened to us, and I reported to the president on the new excise task on metal production and also, you know, the mineral tax extraction task. It was very important for Chelabinsk region, which is one of the mineral producing regions, and they listened to us. 
And first, they wanted to shift it all to the federal level to take all of this additional money. But right now, they revisited this decision, deciding instead to redistribute the additional revenue. So our working group and the State Council Commission are working. We also offered, we suggested an excise on tobacco and redistributed. This will create additional opportunities. We are also willing to look into forgery of tobacco and other problems, and it will help us. There is a number of other proposals that we have put forth. We understand that we are pressed for time, but there are still many other avenues we are pursuing together with our colleagues from the finance ministry and from the government. Thank you. Final question to everyone. We see that there is this feast of uh, willingness to compromise. So, compromise aside, what would you do first and right now? What is the sorest issue? So, what is the most practical issue, something you can achieve right now? Or maybe the most important thing you would achieve right now? Or maybe some turning point? Just one minute for each and everyone. So what would you start with if you have this choice right now? Well, in terms of priority, I think the issue of free resources regions can spend on themselves is so acute, especially for the next several years, that this transfer of uh, payments for mandatory medical insurance, 300 billion to the federal center, freeing this money up for the regions. I think this is a must. This is the most important task to perform, even though there are many other issues needed to adjust the issues. Mr. Minihanov, what do you think? I'm against that. Any changes wouldn't be good. They'll take the, the payment and they will take the income payment. They took 1% from us and said it was the end of it. But still, the issue of orphaned children is there, even though the responsibility and the money trail, everything has been shifted and readjusted and transferred to other levels, but nothing changed. So what we need to do is to bolster up our gross regional product. And we will have enough money for investment and for other purposes we need to develop our economy. We don't want there to be any manipulations. Yes, if a region doesn't have any revenue, they have nothing against that. You can take as much as 10%. But even 1% for us is a huge sum. It's 5 billion or so. Mr. Menihanev is absolutely correct. So if we transfer the powers for the medical insurance, then uh, Mr. Menihanev is afraid that they're going to take something else, some money. So it's absolutely rational. This money has to stay in the region. And, you know, uh, Tadasan is one of the nine regions that account for 60% of all regional revenues. But the money has to stay. Alexei Leonidovich, yes, this is of principal importance. This is about additional revenue, and there should be no compensation involved whatsoever. Not a single region, be that Moscow or Tatarstan or Cherabinsk region. We're also a region with great profitability. We shouldn't suffer because of that. So we need to invest in many issues. We understand that infrastructure and salaries, this is the remit of uh, regions. And besides, there can be a deficit of mandatory medical insurance due to new waves of coronavirus, and regions cannot be simply left to their own devices fighting on their own. They have to be uh, supported. But this has to be done smartly. Yes, 
Please, what we say with Alexei and with Rostam, if this money stays in the region, the finance minister is going to ask where they have to find this uh, another 300 billions. They have to to get additional revenues. Well, in that sense, this is a federal level objective to take up this additional responsibility to find additional space for maneuver. And I think the space is there. Well, let, let's take movables and preferences. We provided some preferences to those companies that we invested. Right now, the decision has been adopted and no one, nobody asked us. If you don't mind, I will conclude by making some comments of my own. I see a consensus emerging because the finance ministry is not present here. If it were, I think the discussion would have taken a different turn. But I would like to point out that there is this institutional decision on total control of all regional expenditures. I would make a different call. We have, for instance, the agricultural ministry that has already uh, finally come up with a, a grand subsidy. They used to have different subsidies, and they merged them finally, maybe the other ministries are gonna to follow in their footsteps and the regions who know better will be able to redistribute money within the education ministry subsidy or other subsidy the money is not ever going to be enough you will always lack something the most important thing missing is that the regions on the ground cannot make a decision of their own, and I am absolutely confident of that. Well, we do have money, and we have the cap capacities. Yes, I know that you'll succeed, but not everyone is as lucky. Well, we agreed with the finance ministry. It's kind of a pilot project. We will try to merge some subsidies for some regions, and maybe we will expand that to other regions as well. But this is a long discussion. You know, it's a stress test whether you will be able to do that or not. But there are some regions with regard to which there are questions. Each and every region has to seek for avenues to bolster their revenues. Because it's about income of people living in the region. They should not rely on benefits. They need to rely on salaries and wages. The finance ministry subsidies is not the best avenue. So we will fight for that, for, for, for greater income, for better redistribution, also for untying the hands of regions and making managerial decisions. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you for this wonderful discussion.